Hi, welcome to the Victor Emanuel Nature Tours webinar. I am Ben Reynolds, producer and host of the VENT webinar series. Thank you for joining today's presentation. We are delighted to offer this educational presentation about birds, nature, and VENT tours. We hope you enjoy today's topic on a wing and a prayer, Birds and Birding in Israel by Jonathan Mayrath. He is joining us live from the foothills of Jerusalem. Welcome, Jonathan. Hi, good evening. Well, good evening for me. Good day to you. <laughs> Vent is thrilled to offer two superb travel opportunities to Israel, one during spring migration and the other a bird's history and culture tour during the fall migration. The itineraries for these departures can be found and downloaded in the handout section in the toolbar. You may ask questions, but please note that we will have a live question and answer session after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our Victor Emanuel YouTube channel to watch on demand anytime at your convenience. A link to the recording will be delivered to you in an email in the next few days. Now, back to our feature presentation. Jonathan Mayrav's interest in birding began at the age of 10, and by age 12, he was the youngest member of a junior birders club. At 14, Jonathan earned his banding license and began participating in elaborate monitoring projects in Israel. As an environmental studies student at Ben Gurion College, Jonathan fell in love with the desert and desert birding and would spend entire days monitoring migrants and taking part in surveys and research programs. Jonathan has traveled the world extensively from the African grasslands to the Amazon jungles and the frozen Can Canadian tundra. To date, he has seen more than 3,000 birds across 25 countries. He has intimate knowledge of the Southern Israel's birds and his ability to lead tours in English, French, Spanish, and Hebrew is incomparable. Today, Jonathan is the most experienced birding tour leader in Israel. His sharp identification skills and a keen interest in desert birds migration, and vagrancy patterns. He spends the migration seasons where the birds do in Elat in the spring and northern Israel in the fall and winter. Since 2010, Jonathan has served as a tourism director of the Israeli Ornithological Center. He spends around 70 days a year guiding foreign bird watchers, donors, and birding tour groups. In recent years, Jonathan and his team have developed several large-scale international events, the Hula and Elliot birding festivals, and several seminars around bird conservation. Jonathan is the coordinator of a new and exciting project, the Champions of the Flyway, an international birdathon that raises funds and awareness against the illegal killing of birds along the flyways. We are thrilled to have Jonathan present about Israel and we hope you enjoy the webinar. Without further ado, we will turn to Jonathan's presentation. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to thank Ben and the team at VENT, uh, well, for asking me uh, to present a little bit, of, to talk a little bit about uh, the wonderful birds that we have in Israel. Uh, like Ben said, event are offering two trips. You'll get more details about those later. And this presentation uh, is built in a way that will give you an overview uh, of the birds and some of the birding projects we have in Israel. It's basically going to be a pretty basic, uh, nice pictures of birds. Uh, and nearly all of these birds that we'll be talking about are birds uh, that you will be able to see if you come birding with me with VENT uh, on the Israel trips. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's get going. This picture uh, sort of sums up uh, what Israel is to me and for people that have been here. Uh, this is a migrating flock of uh, honey buzzards uh, over the Eilat Mountains in Israel. Eilat sits in the extreme southernmost uh, point uh, of Israel bordering uh, with Egypt to the west and with Jordan to the east. And the Eilat Mountains it's, are a massive uh, granite ridge 
that basically causes a funnel effect between the mountains and the Red Sea, uh, causing millions of birds to pour in through a rather narrow corridor. And uh, this picture or, or similar images like this uh, are easily seen uh, during our spring trips. The Eilat Mountains uh, are really rocking uh, during mid-March to mid-April, and that is exactly when uh, the Israel vent trip uh, takes place. This is a picture that sort of sums up a fall migration in Israel. This is a part of a flock of about 11,000 white storks that arrived uh, to an agricultural area in northern Israel in a place called the Bet She'an Valley, which you will hear uh, a bit more about. Um, and this is an everyday scene uh, during the fall migration where nearly the whole world population of white storks uh, funnel through Israel on their way to their breeding grounds in Africa. This happens usually in September, October, with uh, small numbers lingering well into uh, November. And during the fall pre-trip, uh, which is offered alongside the main tour uh, for uh, the fall, we make a point of looking for these specific flocks of storks as they move through uh, the Rift Valley. I think most of most people that have been to the Middle East or to Israel or to the Mediterranean region will recognize this bird. Uh, this is the hoopoe. The hoopoe uh, also happens to be Israel's national bird. Uh, we did a very nice campaign to choose a national bird for Israel uh, a few years ago, and we actually had the public vote. We had 10 finalists or 10 species of birds uh, in the running. And we had people basically vote online and we did big programs in Israel's schools and had people vote for their favorite bird. And uh, the deer hoopo uh, was chosen to be Israel's national bird. If you ask me personally, I think that uh, there were better candidates, uh, but the hoopo is truly a remarkable bird. Um, during our Israel trips, we cannot avoid talking about uh, natural history and we go way back to biblical times. And uh, I have a personal passion uh, to learn and to observe birds that are mentioned in the Holy Scriptures and to see how we can connect the various stories about these birds that are mentioned in the Scriptures. And the hupo is considered to be a symbol of wisdom. It is said uh, that King Solomon which was a very wise man that could speak to animals, apparently, uh, used to consult the hoopo uh, in his palace garden regularly in various issues. And the hoopo, until this day, is considered within Jewish culture as uh, the sign of wisdom. In this case, this bird, uh, I photographed it not far from my house in the middle of the village, and it's actually sunbathing. Hoopos are cavity nesters, uh, slightly uh, related to woodpeckers, they nest in cavities and being the fact that they nest in cavities causes them to, to host a lot of parasites, various fleas, ticks, all kinds of other beasts. And they start their day like this. They jump out, find a nice sunny spot, spread out uh, their feathers and basically sun themselves in order to get rid uh, of many of these parasites. A hoopo is a very common bird in Israel, and any visit to Israel will ensure you good views of this beautiful bird. This is a picture uh, that sums up uh, what a lot of people here think, that Israel is basically the center of the world. And uh, we sure make a lot of noise for the size of the country worldwide. But this map that dates back to 1581, of course, is uh, drawn out for geopolitical and religious reasons. But I really like this because it shows Israel as the connecting component between the three large uh, continents of the old world. We see Europe, Asia, and Africa, and Israel sitting right there in the middle. And if we take this picture and uh, put it in a more schematic uh, view of birds migration, then we can see Israel is strategically positioned as the eastern land bridge that, that connects the three continents east of the Mediterranean Sea. Birds prefer not to migrate over large bodies of water. 
So many birds, even birds nesting in Northwestern Europe or Central Europe, which could have flown to Africa and back in a much shorter route, would prefer to make a slight diversion and not migrate over the Mediterranean Sea. And that's why the Israeli migration corridor harnesses hundreds and hundreds of millions of birds. The estimates are between 600 and 700 million individual birds that migrate through Israel twice a year. This is a graphic uh, simulation of eBird reports about the migration corridors during the migration period in the month of October. And in this picture, I really like it because you see the stronger the color pink, the higher a volume of migration. And we can really see what I just spoke about. You see the Mediterranean Sea in the middle and the European population of birds basically flying southeast, not avoiding crossing the Mediterranean, funnel down through Israel and down to Africa where they spend the winter. After a few months in Africa, they take the same corridor back. It's pretty easy for birds wintering in East Africa to find their way because they follow the Syro-African Rift Valley. The Rift Valley that starts in Syria and ends in Eastern Africa is sort of a, almost like a marker, visual marker for birds migrating north and south. And we see how mainly soaring birds really follow uh, the actual Rift Valley. Another reason why Israel has so many birds, first of all, uh, this is uh, what is called a Palestine sunbird or an orange, tuft or an orange tufted sunbird. This is the only uh, representative of the sunbird family in Israel. We don't have any flashy hummingbirds uh, or some of those cool birds uh, in the new world and in the tropics, hummingbirds and, and stuff like that. We have this little guy, uh, which is one of Israel's smallest birds. Uh, this was photographed in my garden and the Palestine sunbird, very beautiful. The males have this nice iridescent sheen and Israel truly is amazing because our size doesn't really matter. Israel is a very small country, 320 miles top to bottom. At the widest area, it's about 90 miles, 95 miles at the widest area. But within this very small country, we have very nice, uh, diverse habitats. We have a lot of natural spaces and 80% of the population resides around the center of the country. So once you leave the hustle and bustle, the metropolis of Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, and you move either north or south, then the population dwindles quickly and the wide open spaces uh, open up, hosting very high diversity uh, of wildlife, uh, not just birds. In Israel, there is nearly no hunting at all. There's no hunting of game. And uh, any visit to Israel will secure very good views of lots of very cool mammals, which I will also point out here pretty soon. So it's not just birds. It's just really beautiful in-your-face nature, beautiful landscapes, and very, very diverse habitats. If you compare places like the U.S. or Canada, where you need to drive many hours in order for the habitat to change. In Israel, every 20, 30 miles, we enter a different uh, habitat zone from the alpine meadows uh, of Northern Israel and all the way down to Southern Israel, to the deserts that become starker and drier as you go south. One of the most amazing periods in Israel is the fall migration and into the winter. Here we see a picture of common cranes in the Hula Valley. The Hula Valley is an amazing uh, location in northern Israel. It sits within the Rift Valley, about 20 miles or 15 miles south of the, our northern border uh, with Lebanon. And this amazing wetland, uh, which was once uh, historically the Hula Lake, was one of the most important natural wetlands uh, in this part of the world. Sadly, it was drained in the early days of Israel, but it was reflooded during the 1990s, restoring uh, the Hula Valley habitat and the birds engaged very, very quickly and came back uh, to the Hula Valley. Just a bit further south is that place that I mentioned, the Bet Valley. 
Uh, this is a picture of a large mixed flock of black storks and egrets with a few gulls there as well. This is a picture looking east and the hills you see in the background are well within Jordan. The Bet Sheaan Valley sits right on the border uh, with Jordan and uh, our border with Jordan is our longest border actually. And uh, it's a very peaceful border and a lot of the birding that we do in the Rift Valley is literally on the border with Jordan. This is another picture uh, of a flock of white storks in the Bet Sheaan Valley, again, looking east to the hills in Jordan. This flock spent the night here in the fields, just basically on the ground, preening, relaxing, and in the morning, when the sun starts heating up the ground and the thermals start to develop, these guys uh, take off and continue their day of migration. But flocks like this of several hundred storks are a daily sight from the month of September and all the way to the month of December. And like I said, it's always a must visit site in order to see impressive flocks of soaring birds, not just storks, but many, many others. The Bet Sheaan Valley that I mentioned is home to some very special species. Uh, on the bottom right, we see the Dead Sea Sparrow. Dead Sea Sparrow is a special sparrow that well, originally used to, it's named the Dead Sea Sparrow, but it's actually common in various other places in the Eastern Valleys, not just around the Dead Sea, a very handsome little sparrow. And above it, we see the turtle dove. The turtle dove is another one of those iconic birds that is mentioned in the scriptures. In the Song of Songs, there's a phrase, and the cooing of the dove was heard through the land. This was the sign of the coming spring to Israel. The doves spend the winter in Africa and return to Israel during the month of March. And, and when they return, slowly this cooing of the dove uh, still today is one of our favorite sounds uh, of the spring. And the Bet Sheaan Valley and the Eastern Valley still holds extensive populations of this dove that sadly is declining in other places, but that is a different story. Two more iconic birds uh, of northern Israel, mainly during the winter and into spring. The gull is a palace's gull, uh, what was once called great black-headed gull. This is one of the largest gulls in the world and also uh, quite a rare gull. It nests uh, around the Caspian Sea in Asia and Israel hosts about 20 to 30 percent of the wintering population. The whole world population, about 20 or 30 percent of that winters in Israel every year. On the bottom right, we see a handsome black stork. Black storks are much rarer than white storks, number-wise. Uh, white storks, we get about 600,000 passing through Israel every year. Black storks, it's more in the 20, 25,000 individuals, with about 3,000 of them remaining to spend the winter uh, with us in Israel. This is a really beautiful bird, a special story. Uh, and one that we make a point in observing and enjoying during our Israel trips. Back to the Hula Valley. This is an aerial photo of the reflooded area. Like I mentioned, this used to be one of the most important bodies of water uh, in the whole of the Middle East. Sadly, the Middle East has lost some significant bodies of water in the past couple of decades. Um, the Hula Valley, the original lake was dried up. Uh, the Mesopotam Mesopotamian marshes in Iraq uh, suffered strongly during the Gulf Wars and are now nearly gone. There's a big wetland in Jordan that is now nearly dry. So the importance of these wetlands is, is amazing. You know, you cannot underestimate the importance of this wetland. And the fact that the Hula Valley was reflooded and now actually operates as a park for birds and wildlife is very, very important. It's not only an amazing place to visit, you know, driving around, birding, enjoying amazing numbers of birds. It's also a crucial stopover site for birds migrating from the north to Africa. South of the Hula Valley, the habitat becomes very dry very, very quickly. And the birds know that this is their last chance to fuel up or gas up before they hit the desert strip to the south. This is uh, what the reflooded area looks like. 
on a winter day. The Hula is of crucial importance uh, to the whole European population of white pelicans. Our white pelicans are similar to the American white pelican, slightly smaller, but not uh, just as impressive, of course. Beautiful birds, a nine foot wingspan, heavy. And these birds, the whole European population moves through Israel with large numbers remaining to spend the winter with us. And any of our trips, both the fall uh, and the spring trips, uh, we will ad admire these amazing birds. This is just a regular sight of a flock resting, preening during the day. This was shot during uh, the vent trip this past November. But the most iconic bird uh, of the Hula Valley is the common crane or Eurasian common crane. Common cranes a nest in Europe and in Western Asia with the bulk of the population nesting in Russia and in Siberia. And during the fall, about 150,000 migrate south to Africa with up to 30% of that remaining to spend the winter in Israel. And this is just a regular site from November onwards in the Hula Valley where 40, 45, 48,000 common cranes spend the winter together. This is truly an amazing thing to, to observe. Noisy, colorful, charismatic, uh, beautiful birds. Um, and after a couple of days in Northern Israel, you cannot shake the, the whooping calls uh, of common cranes because they are just so common, undisturbed and just uh, going about their business. One of the most amazing experiences is what you see here. It's called the mobile hide. The mobile hide is a, basically a contraption, as you can see, a farmer that attached a wagon behind his tractor. Notice that the cranes don't really mind when he drives uh, the agricultural machinery through the flocks. The Hula Valley, uh, besides being a park, is an active agricultural area. Within the park boundaries, you have natural spaces, you have semi-natural spaces, and you have intensive agricultural fields. And the, these cranes wander around these fields, sometimes creating damage. And um, the farmers notice that when they drive their tractors around, the cranes don't mind. So one of the farmers uh, from Northern Israel decided to try and put a wagon and take some people uh, to observe the cranes. It started with a little small wagon with four or five people with a closed hide and has developed to what you see now, an impressive wagon that basically drives right into the flocks of cranes, offering remarkable views, sounds, really immerse yourself within the flocks of common cranes. There is no other experience like it anywhere in the world. It's truly remarkable, almost spiritual. Uh, during our trips, we offer a, a sunrise trip and uh, we go with the mobile hide to the water's edge where the cranes spend the night and basically start the day with the cranes, immerse ourselves in their calls, and it's truly an amazing experience. These are just some shots from these uh, mobile hide uh, trips. This is a wide angle shot. The birds are very, very close. With so many birds and beautiful landscapes, then you can go as artistic as you want with the shots. Uh, this is a shot right at sunrise at the golden light. Another amazing spectacle in the Hula Valley is the raptors. Uh, anyone that likes birds of prey, this is like a raptor enthusiast's heaven. Um, these fields that grow mainly feed uh, alfalfa or various other sprouts that are grown uh, for the cattle if, as cattle food. Uh, host various uh, species of raptors. These raptors, having arrived on migration, are hungry and they run around the fields uh, chasing voles. Uh, in this picture, we see a uh, lesser spotted eagle on the right and a greater spotted eagle on the left, both juvenile birds side by side, running around like turkeys in the fields chasing voles. It's truly an amazing spectacle. Enjoy large numbers of birds of prey 
very good quality species. And just anywhere you look, there's going to be an eagle or a buzzard or falcons or harriers. A, really a raptor enthusiast heaven. Greater spotted eagle, one of the world's uh, endangered and rarest eagles. Less than 3,000 pairs of these birds remain, nesting mainly exactly where the war is going on uh, in the Ukraine, Belarus, um, Western Russia, in the forests. And Israel is one of the most important wintering areas for greater spotted eagle. It's actually the most common eagle that we see during the fall and winter here in Israel. And views like this are an everyday sight. Another rare and impressive eagle is the Eastern Imperial Eagle, one of the large Aquila eagles and also a rare bird with only a few thousand pairs left worldwide. And again, Israel in general and the Northeastern Valleys, the Hula Valley and Bet She'an Valley, is one of the most important breeding uh, wintering areas uh, for this impressive eagle. Uh, this is a young bird. I love their beautiful blonde golden uh, plumage and views like this are again an everyday thing uh, in the Hula Valley. The Hula hosts a lot of mammals. Uh, here we see a golden jackal uh, with a crane leg. Of course, when you have 40,000 cranes in one area, there's going to be a few dead birds every morning, birds that didn't survive the night or bird, weaker birds. And uh, the golden jackals of the Hula Valley uh, know how to capitalize on this issue. And uh, there is no visit early morning or late afternoon driving around the fields where we don't see numerous uh, golden jackals. And in general, golden jackal is the most one of the most common mammals uh, in Israel, very common in agricultural areas. Uh, beautiful animal. One of the rarer mammals that we have, and again, the Hula Valley is the place to see them, is the jungle cat or swamp cat. This is a cat that comes from Asia, with Israel being the westernmost point in the world uh, to find this cat. Um, this a cat that loves water. They really like water. They swim very well. They hunt for fish, and they also sneak up on wading birds from the water. And this is a shot that we took uh, at first light on a foggy morning. And uh, this uh, beautiful beast uh, probably is recovering from a long night of activity. And uh, this was shot from the mobile hide of the cranes. If you look north from the Hula Valley, you cannot miss Mount Hermon or Hermon. Israel's highest mountain peak, sitting right on the border with Syria. Uh, this is Israel's only snow-covered mountain, uh, over 6,500 feet high, holds snow. It, it actually has snow now. There was a good snowfall this winter, and uh, we still have snow on Mount Hermon, and we're in the month of May. It's not a regular thing. And Mount Hermon and the alpine habitats uh, host a nice range of birds which cannot be found anywhere else in the country and are also considered to be like Middle Eastern specialties, birds that can only be found in places like Turkey, uh, Iran, Syria, and Northern Israel. Some of these include on the top right, the Syrian serin. Syrian serin um, is one of the birds that is closest uh, to an endemic that we have. Israel doesn't really have any real endemic birds. Syrian serin is a bird that nests in the Hermon mountain range, high in the mountains. And uh, during the fall, it migrates south only a few hundred miles to the deserts of Israel. So basically its whole migration cycle is less than 1,000 miles uh, throughout the year from the mountain uh, in northern Israel to the Negev desert, to the hills for the winter and back. So it's got a very, very restricted range, and it's one of the species we target in Mount Hermon, a really beautiful, handsome finch. On the bottom right, uh, we see what is similar to your chickadees. This is a sombre tit. You call them chickadees, we call them tits here in the old world. And sombre tit uh, is restricted only to Mount Hermon from 3,000 feet and up. The bottom left, we see a Syrian black red start. Black red start is a bird that is common throughout Europe, but this particular uh, subspecies 
uh, Ochrorus uh, nests only in Mount Hermon in Israel, Lebanon, and Syria, and very handsome little bird. And on the top left is the crimson winged finch, another specialist of high elevations. The only place you can see them in Israel is above 6,000 feet in Mount Hermon, and it's one of the birds that we look for when we go up there. When you go back down a little bit, then we encounter species like the black Franklin on the right. Franklin uh, is common both in Africa and in Asia. We have one representative in Israel, uh, the black Franklin. It's a very shy grouse-like bird or, well, partridge-like bird. Um, right now, they're easy to see, and in the spring, they sing, so they're pretty easy. Uh, we had remarkable views of these guys uh, on this uh, recent vent trip in March. And besides this, we have a Rufus bush robin, which is on the top left, and long-billed pipit uh, on the bottom left. Long-billed pipit, again, a very range-restricted species that can only be found in various habitats uh, in Israel. As we work our way south, uh, both our trips include a visit to the West Negev, the Negev Desert, basically consists, the whole southern half of Israel is considered to be desert. The West Negev is not really a harsh desert. It's more of a semi-desert area, not super dry. It doesn't get a lot of rain, but it gets some. But it's fairly green and very active with agricultural projects. And this area hosts some very cool species. Uh, on the right, we see an adult eastern imperial eagle on top. And again, uh, the greater spotted eagle on the bottom right. And the falcon you see on the left is called a saker falcon. It's one of the larger, most impressive falcons in the world. And actually, this is the falcon um, that started uh, what is known as falconry. As you know, that uh, in Arabic cultures uh, in the Middle East, in the Arabian Peninsula, the Gulf states, um, falconry is still common, sadly, uh, with the sheiks and with royalty. And this is the falcon that started it all. Saker, very, very impressive, large bird, uh, specializes on powerful hunting uh, of big prey. And the West Negev is the only place where you can reliably see them in this part of the world. Uh, something like four individuals winter here. We know where they are. And it's one of those birds that we specifically target when we visit the West Negev. A few more birds uh, that come from a more eastern origin. On the top right, we see a citron wagtail with the yellow face. On the top left, we see a Dorian shrike. And on the bottom, we see sociable lapwings or sociable plovers. What these three birds have in common is that they're Asian species. They don't nest in actual Europe, but they nest in Western Asia, Siberia, Kazakhstan, and even further east. And these birds don't migrate south for the winter, but rather they migrate southwest. And from their breeding grounds, they fly to Israel where they spend the winter months. The sociable lapwing is a critically endangered species, sadly. And Israel today is the place in the world to catch up with a sociable lapwing. One of the jewels, the jewels of the crown of Israeli birding, and not just Israeli birding, but I'd say worldwide, is the Eilat region. I mentioned it before. This is another shot in the Eilat Mountains, like that first slide where, you, where the buzzards uh, were thermaling or kettling. In the background, you see the Red Sea and the massive uh, granite ridge of the Eilat Mountains. Eilat is a crucial stopover site for birds on both journeys, both in the south, uh, when they're in the fall when they go south, and in the, especially in the spring when the birds are moving back uh, from Africa back to their breeding grounds. Basically, these birds have just crossed the Sahara Desert, the big strip of desert, over 1,000 miles of desert in Africa, and arrive in Eilat where they can finally find resources, food, water, where they can fuel up and relax uh, before they continue their journey. It's really one of those magical places uh, where you can encounter species like the shy uh, Sinai rosefinch on the right, 
this beautiful pinkish bird that can only be found uh, in the mountains of southern Israel and Egypt, and two very rare species of warblers. On the top, we have a cypress warbler. Cypress warbler is a bird that nests only on the island of Cyprus. The whole world population nests in Cyprus, but they migrate in, in the winter, and a lot of them winter here in Israel. And on the bottom left is an Asian desert warbler, which uh, nests again in the steppes of uh, Western Asia and migrates to Israel to spend the winter. And these are three birds which are high on our wish list uh, when we visit Eilat and the desert wadis around it. This is a typical view uh, of a wadi. Uh, wadi is an Arabic word that basically means a, a barren riverbed that occasionally flash floods. And this is the situation in the southern Negev desert and Eilat, dry for most of the year. But in the winter, you get some major rain systems that cause, cause these wadis to flood. These floods can be large, can be aggressive, um, but they also bring life to the desert. And this typical wadi, besides a dead tree, you can see some flowering bushes. Uh, bushes. Uh, these are Ocradenus bacatus, a specific species of plant native to southern Israel. And these plants act as actual fueling stations. If I'm birding through a wadi, if I find these bacatus plants, then I'm going to find the birds. The birds know that these uh, plants have both flowers with it, which attract insects and very lush fruit that holds a lot of sugar. And if you walk in the middle of nowhere and you find these bushes, you will find various passerines, warblers and such uh, that are fueling up uh, on these bushes. One of the iconic birds of southern Israel is the Arabian uh, bee eater or was, was called little green bee eater until recently. This is a garden bird for us uh, in southern Israel. Uh, one of the smaller members of the bee eater family and a beautiful, beautiful uh, bird. But again, uh, the claim to fame of the Eilat uh, area is the Eilat Mountains on migration. In this case, we see a steppe eagle. Uh, again, a rare eagle that nests in the steppes of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. They're very hard to see on the breeding grounds. You need to cover large areas. But if you come to Israel in March and sit in the Eilat Mountains, you see dozens to hundreds every day, close views, an incredible bird of prey uh, to witness, and with the background backdrop of the Eilat Mountains, uh, truly memorable. Eilat is really the Mecca uh, for foreign bird watchers, and this is a regular sight when something good shows up. Uh, well, this is pre-COVID, of course. We are very happy that Hopefully this COVID era uh, is behind us and we're very, very happy to greet tourists in large numbers uh, already this spring uh, to Israel. But uh, this is what it looks like uh, when something good shows up in the area of Eilat. In some years uh, before COVID, we had up to 3,000 uh, birders visiting Eilat during a narrow period of time. Um, it's not crowded. It just means that more good birds are found. Just another little selection of migrants. Again, this presentation um, is going to be a lot to take in, uh, many, many species, but this is what birding in Israel really is. Uh, you guys uh, know how it is to go birding in migration areas where you just don't know what to expect uh, in the next bush or in the next pool. And um, here we see species like the blue throat on the left, a visitor from Scandinavia. Bee eater on the bottom center, barn swallow, which you know, eh, on the bottom right. Eh, going back up, we have a redback trike, a common kingfisher, a warbler eh, called a lesser white throat on the top, a common red start on the top left, and right in the middle, the wader is a little stint. Just a small selection of birds, which we see every day eh, during migration. A few more again. Uh, this picture really sums up spring uh, in Eilat, late March to be specific. Um, you can see in the center, in the top center, we see a flock uh, of a black stork, a greater spotted eagle, and a buzzard together. This is a regular thing over the Eilat Mountains. And I like it because these birds come from different places 
uh, in the world, spent the winter together in Africa and are now migrating back home. Once they go north from Eilat, they will each go their separate direction. Uh, the greater spotted eagle and the black stork will probably go to northeastern Europe, and this buzzard will go even further east into Asia. On the top left, we see a Namakwa dove, a very small, attractive dove uh, that comes from Africa. Israel is the northernmost point in the world to see it. Uh, and the three birds on the bottom are Mediterranean birds. Uh, on the bottom right is a Kretschmar's bunting, a, a classic Mediterranean breeder that spends uh, the summer in Israel. In the middle bottom is a Rynek, W-R-Y neck, a, a very shy bird that nests deep in the forests of East Europe. And in Israel, this was shot on a median in the middle of the city of Eilat. Migration will do it for you. These birds are so hungry and eat the fuel up that even on a highway, in a median, between the cars, uh, this little uh, Rynek was running around the grass eating ants. And on the bottom left is a Rappel's warbler. Rappel's warbler nests in the Greek islands and into Turkey and is a common migrant throughout Israel. Just another example of uh, some of the habitats of southern Israel. Uh, on the left, we see this nice sandy dune-like area, which hosts species like wheat ears and larks, and the spring bloom on the right in the desert, which is again a welcome haven uh, for birds on migration. This is a hooded wheat ear. Uh, the wheat ears are a very special family. Uh, in Israel, we have over well, 12 species of wheat ears, which many of them we see on our tours. Hooded wheat ear is a resident in Israel. It's one of our rarer resident wheat ears, and they like this sandy dune-like areas. We have some very cool larks. Larks are another uh, family that is represented with many species in Israel, both uh, Mediterranean type larks, but also rarer larks. On the bottom right, we see a greater hoopo lark named after the hoopo because of its long uh, bill. And on the top left is a very rare lark called the Arabian lark, which is very sporadic and unexpected, but has been showing up in recent years in the same areas uh, that I mentioned. Like I said, a lot sits right uh, on the Gulf of the Red Sea. And the Red Sea, the Gulf of Eilat is the tip of the Red Sea, and the Red Sea is basically an extension of the Indian Ocean. So Eilat, the southernmost point in Israel, again, this is a picture looking from Israel east, uh, looking at the city of Aqaba in Jordan. The border with Jordan goes right in the middle of the Red Sea. And this place called the North Beach is an amazing place uh, for birding because we get a lot of species from the Red Sea that don't go any further north. So species like this white-eyed gull, one of the rarest gulls in the world that breeds only in islands off the Red Sea, very attractive gull, and Eilat is the only place where you could see it in the country. They're common in Eilat, um, but you have to come to Eilat to see it, and this is a beautiful adult in uh, pristine plumage. Another one of these is a western reef heron or western reef egret another species that nests in islands in the Red Sea, and Eilat is the place to see it. Just north of Eilat, uh, we have a very extensive set of salt pans. Um, they used to be industrial salt pans. Now there's no work being done, and the basins are just there, uh, mainly for salt, uh, slow processing, basically letting the water evaporate slowly, and then the salt is slowly harvested. And this area is an amazing place for water birds, holding hundreds of greater flamingos. Um, any day you come to uh, these salt pans, you'll see anywhere between 300 and 600 flamingos, together with a wide range of other uh, water birds. Greater flamingos. This is a picture. Um, of a flock of white-winged terns. White-winged terns nests in Eastern Europe and moves through Israel in large numbers, large flocks. Uh, I've seen flocks of over 10,000 strong, really, really amazing. And this is an evening 
where a flock of about 3,000 of these terns just came in over the Red Sea and settled down for the night in the salt pans that I just mentioned. A really remarkable sight. All the birds are in summer plumage on their way back up to the breeding grounds. And uh, just another one of those amazing moments uh, of an afternoon birding around Eilat. The salt pans host many waders, including some pretty cool ones. Uh, the bottom left is a Kentish plover. They nest in the salt pans. You can see this uh, picture of a mom with the chick. Uh, on the bottom right, we see a rough uh, molting into summer plumage. This is in the spring. And... On the top right is a broad-billed sandpiper. It's a rare wader that nests in Russia and moves through Israel in good numbers. And on the top left is a marsh sandpiper, pretty similar to your lesser yellow legs uh, superficially, uh, with that needle bill uh, and very beautiful frosty plumage. Again, nests in Eastern Europe and moves through Israel in good numbers. If we start working our way back up, uh, we, we become uh, to the semi-desert area of Nitsana. Nitsana is an area uh, nestled not far from the Egyptian border, about 120 miles uh, north of Eilat. Um, and this special area hosts very wide open spaces uh, with very little disturbance. These spaces are either nature reserves or army training areas. Army training areas uh, may sound uh, intimidating, but the fact of the matter is that in Israel, a lot of areas are training areas, um, and during the weekends, they're all open. So people uh, in areas where there's training during the week, uh, on Friday and Saturday, we can go birding. And many of these places host amazing birds and actually act just like a, water, a nature reserve because there is no disturbance. The bird that we look for uh, when we bird around Nitsana is the McQueen's Bustard. Uh, this is an amazing bird, uh, terrestrial, about the size of your turkey, which has an incredible display. Uh, this is a bird that used to be common throughout the Middle East uh, and into the Arabian Peninsula, but it was completely wiped out uh, from the whole of the Middle East, and the last remaining population is in Israel, something like 200 birds, 200 individuals. The number is stable, it has not really uh, dropped in uh, recent years. But McQueen's Bustard is the bird that we come to search when we uh, go birding in Nitsana. Both our trips, of course, include an early morning session uh, to look for these bustards. And during our recent vent trip in March, we were also fortunate uh, to see the bustards displaying. They have an amazing display where they puff up these long breast feathers, puff themselves up into a ball and start running around dancing in the desert. Truly a remarkable sight of a truly remarkable bird. Another one of the Nitsana specialties is the cream colored courser. This is a bird that is actually a shorebird. Of course, it has nothing to do with water and spends its life in the open desert, but cream colored courser uh, Nitsana, again, is the place to see them. We do encounter them in various other places in the desert, but they nest around Nitsana. And as their name implies, a courser, they spend most of their lives on the ground, running back and forth. A very beautiful bird and one of my personal uh, iconic favorites. The Nitsana area is amazing for mammals. Again, very little disturbance. In this case, we see Dorcas gazelle. We have two species of gazelle in Israel, um, the mountain gazelle in central and northern Israel, and the Dorcas gazelle or the Negev gazelle in the south. And here we see a, a father a, with a fawn. A, and again, this is something that we see on all of our trips. They're very common. And it really makes uh, Israel such a special destination that mammals uh, are a major part uh, of the trip. Asian wild ass or uh, onager. Uh, these uh, were reintroduced into Israel in the 1980s. A herd of 40 was released and now there's 400 strong running around uh, the deserts of southern Israel. Completely wild animals and Really, really an amazing sight in the wide open desert to encounter these beautiful wild donkeys. And if you're really lucky, 
you can encounter a, an Arabian wolf. Uh, the Arabian wolf is a very small subspecies of the European wolves. You can see it looks a bit skinny and uh, uh, small. It's not a big wolf, um, but it's still a wolf. And it's one that we regularly see uh, early in the morning or late in the day. This female that I photographed, it was middle of the day, crossed the road, uh, checked me out. Uh, it was really rewarding to see. And uh, it's not rare to see them on our trips. Moving back up and back to the Mediterranean coast, um, like I said, Israel's diverse habitats, uh, the coast has some pretty cool beaches, uh, a long strip of beaches, uh, and along these beaches are not only uh, the coastal uh, marshes, but also uh, significant fish pond complexes, and of course fish ponds are awesome for birds. Just in this picture we see about eight species, a black-winged stilt, uh, there's a dunlin there, little turn on the left, common ringed plover flying, a very nice selection of waders. And again, a few more shots of waders, a dunlin flock, a bar-tailed godwit on the bottom left, and citron wagtails, uh, which I mentioned earlier, also show up uh, on these coastal pools. Israel is an amazing place for kingfishers. We have three species of kingfishers. On the top right, we see the white-breasted kingfisher, an Asian species that Israel is the westernmost point in the world to see them. On the top left, we see a pied kingfisher, which is an African species, and Israel is the northernmost point in the world where you can see them. The bottom right, we see Egyptian mongoose, which is very, very common along uh, the coastal plains, and a nice congregation of great egrets on the left. In the middle is an Armenian gull, the most common large gull uh, in Israel. I just want to mention uh, our fall trip uh, coincides uh, with one of the most impressive uh, migration phenomena in Israel. Here we see an aerial image of Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv, Israel's second largest city and effectively our culture capital a very big metropolis, very busy area, but just north of the city, literally one mile north of the city, you can see that area that is marked in red, is a still natural space where during the month of November, um, there's an amazing migration of songbirds. And you go there and you can really see huge flocks of wheat ears, warblers, finches, moving through in large numbers. And on recent vent trips, we actually started our first morning here, enjoying some of this migration. This is just a small selection of some of the rarities we encounter sometimes. The white-headed duck, a very rare duck that we make a point in uh, looking for. Uh, the pallid scops owl, a very small uh, owl that winters in the desert. Um, small skylark on the top left and oriental honey buzzard a rare visitor from Asia that we have seen on previous trips. And we can't talk about Israel without talking about bee eaters once again. This is European bee eater as opposed uh, to the green bee eater that we saw before. European bee eaters are common summer visitors and we see them in big numbers on both of our trips. And sometimes we're lucky enough to run into blue-cheeked bee eater that nests east of us but moves through Israel in the fall, we have small numbers. In the spring, larger numbers of this beautiful, colorful bee eater. Another iconic bird of Israel's skies is the Egyptian vulture, a, a very special vulture that specializes. You see that thin bill. It's a scraper, a cleaner. It basically arrives to the carcass after the bigger birds are done, and it usually scrapes the remaining meat off the bones. An Egyptian vulture, a common sight, a very beautiful in its own way and a common sight in Israel's deserts. I mentioned the wheat ears uh, on the left. We see white crowned wheat ear on the top and mourning wheat ear, mourning as in uh, not mourning, but when you mourn someone. Um, two of our resident wheat ears, very common in the desert. And on the right, we see two representatives of the sand grouse family. Sand grouse are shy. 
uh, hardy birds living in the harsh uh, deserts of Israel. And we make a point in visiting specific uh, pools where these sand grouse come to drink either in the morning or the evening. We can see five different species of sand grouse uh, on an Israel trip. Another cool mammal we encounter both in northern Israel and in the south is the Syrian rock hyrax, uh, related to the rock hyrax that you may have seen in Africa. Very cool mammals. You may or not know that uh, their closest actual relatives are elephants. They have tiny tusks and a very, very special uh, looking animal. Very common, cute, charismatic. Another two iconic species that coincide with our fall trip, again, the pelicans that I mentioned earlier, and lesser spotted eagle. The whole world population of lesser spotted eagle moves through Israel twice a year. So I'd like to invite you, uh, come burning with us. And when I say do your part for conservation is because I work for an NGO, the Society for Protection of Nature in Israel. We are a nonprofit and we are the largest environmental NGO in Israel. We are not an official tour operator. I mean, we have, of course, all the credentials of a tour operator, but it is not what we focus on. The birding tours that we lead and the nature tours that we lead provide very, very important income for our other projects. The proceeds from the tours basically go directly to protecting the very birds and the very habitats that you see on the trips. And I'm very grateful for Victor, uh, and for Barry Lyon, uh, that when they came to Israel for the first trip, they were so impressed with our conservation work that they really insisted that our proceeds from these trips will go to specific bird-related projects in the country. And we are very happy to do this. I mean, the proceeds from the trip don't go into any of our pockets, but rather are invested directly back into bird and nature conservation. Um, Ben, you can take it from here if you like. Um, these are uh, the fall tour dates. Yeah, we just wanted to show people what our 2022 and 2023 fall tour dates are. And contact Greg Lopez, the tour operations manager, should you have any questions or would like to sign up. Or uh, check out our website for the detailed itinerary. And then for the spring tour dates with... Andrew Whitaker uh, is for 2023, the spring migration, Southern Israel in March. Uh, we have a pre-trip to the Jordan Valley and then the main trip, a spring migration spectacular, March 19th through April 2nd. And Greg Lopez is also the tour operations manager. So contact him should you have any questions. Excellent. So uh, I'd really like to thank you guys uh, for tuning in. I hope uh, you enjoyed it. I know it's a lot to take in, but this is a uh, birding and nature in Israel. And I really, really uh, hope that I can meet some of you guys in person in here and show you some of these amazing birds uh, firsthand. Thank you. And thank you, Jonathan. That was a very impressive presentation. It's my pleasure, uh, and uh, yeah, we can take uh, questions. Yeah, let's let's see if people have any questions, uh, either in the chat or in the Q and A section. Uh, and while those are coming in, I do want to point out that crane tractor was amazing. <laughs> it's really it's really cool. It's a it was an innovation of a farmer that basically said, "Let me try it," and uh, it turned into a thriving business. Um, it's really amazing really is let me ask you this does does the tractor itself have a name the tractor itself does not have a name but the actual the different wagons have names uh, one is called hoopo one is called the kingfisher they're named after birds naturally <laughs> that's great uh we have a comment here from cynthia she says outstanding presentation i've wanted to go to israel for a long time and now i want to go even more I'll be more than happy to show you around, Cynthia. <laughs> um, Marty has a question about uh, 
estimating numbers of birds in a flock. How do you make estimates of large numbers? Like, for example, if there's 11,000 cranes or 50,000 cranes. So that's a good question. Um, with cranes, it's fairly easy because we do the counts as they leave the body of water in the morning. The whole population sleeps together on a lake. And in the morning, we have teams of two people per team surrounding the lake. And every bird that leaves the lake and flies over their head is counted. They do not look back. They only look forward. And then you sum up all the counts of the people around the lake. And that gives you a pretty current uh, and good estimate. Um, it's, e it's easier than doing this with large numbers moving through the sky, for example. When you have a location in which all the birds gradually leave from, then you count everybody that leaves. It's much easier and you can get pretty accurate counts. Nowadays, we also have some more technological stuff. Um, we send up drones to photograph uh, the flock as they come to roost. And then you can analyze the drone photos and get pretty accurate estimates of the numbers. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, you talked about uh, Israel's um, bird that was selected. And there were other birds that were on that list. Can you tell us a few of the other ones and which one you would have chosen? For, yeah, sure. Uh, one of those was a spur-winged lapwing. It's a very common uh, bird uh, of agricultural areas. Uh, it's very noisy, uh, very full of character, a lot like Israeli people, you know, make a lot of noise, bold. Um, it's it's sort of like your killdeers, you know, that fly around and screaming, dive bombing if you, if you enter their uh, area. Spur-winged lapwings are like that. And one of the others uh, was the Palestine sunbird, uh, which I really, really like. Um, so I would go for the Palestine sunbird. Uh, the name was a bit of a deterrent for a few Israelis. Um, but other than that, I th think it's an amazing, uh, really an amazing bird and a true candidate. Barbara has a question. Do the wetlands, marshes... Oh. It just disappeared. Sorry. So maybe, maybe uh, she withdrew it or she's rewriting it. Well, I guess at this time we don't have any more chats or questions. So I want to thank everybody for attending today's webinar presentation with Jonathan about Israel. If you do have any questions in the future, please reach out to me, ben at ventbird.com or Greg Lopez, Greg at ventbird.com, if you have questions about the tour registration. So thanks, everybody. I hope you have a great day. Thanks, everyone.